Jesus name. Come on, church, why don't we worship together here in this place? And on the third, I pray for the Son of heaven that rose again. Oh, trample death, where is your sting? The angels roar, oh, Christ the King. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore, for endless days. We will sing your praise, oh Lord, oh Lord our God. The ground begins to shake, the stone was thrown away. His perfect love could not be overcome. Now death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you defeated. Forever He is glorified. Forever He is lifted high. Forever He is risen. He is alive. He is Christ, my 
blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Come on, church, why don't we worship together here in this place? On the third, at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. Oh, trample death, where is your sting? The angels roar, oh, Christ the King. Hi, my name is Joel Adams, pastor here at River Hills Church. We're so glad you've joined our live stream. Throughout the day, we're gonna have a message out of God's word, a time of communion, some worship. We pray that God is touching your heart through that. And if you need to respond in any way, we hope you do so. We're so glad you're here. Good morning. Why don't you come stand with us? Uh, we are uh, excited to have a, a time of worship this morning, and I think we're going to play a song. This first song we've done it a few times here. It I found that it, personally, that it's impossible to stand still whilst singing the song. So hopefully, you find the same, and that we worship God and just have a lot of fun uh, in His presence this morning.
the scripture, um, like we have one or two words for worship. We have like worship and praise. But in scripture, when we read through the Old Testament and the New, we, there's a ton of different words for worship and praise. And they mean different things. They, some of them are to dance. Some of them are to um, clap our hands like we just did. But one of the other words, a couple of the other words in the Hebrew and the Greek um, for worship are to lift up our hands. And um, I don't know if you've ever lifted up your hands in worship. Some of you have and, and some of you haven't. But one of the amazing things when we lift up our hands is a sign of surrendering to God saying, I don't have anything else, but here I am and I'll give you what I got. And that's what this next song's about, is that we get an opportunity to practice worshiping through expressing with our body our praise to God. And so I want to challenge you this morning, wherever you're at. I know a lot of you like to say, hey, you know, just lift up your hands and worship when we when we sing that so that so that what we're saying with our mouth matches what our body is doing. For some of you, are like, yeah, that's really natural. For some of you, like, I've never done that before. Um, I just want you to practice today. I want you to practice matching what our mouth says with, with what our bodies are doing. Because when we stand and if we sing, like with the last song, if we're singing about dancing in the presence of God, we're standing there singing it like this, we're not really matching what our mouth is saying with our actions. Similarly with raising our hands, if we say, so I'll throw up my hands and praise you again like this song says, and you're standing there like this, we're not really matching what our mouth is saying with the expression. You don't have to put your hands away. Just, I, I just want you to practice in some way lifting up your hands and worship and surrender to God as we sing these words together.
Boy, that's just it, isn't it? That that we worship God. That we worship Him for all that He has done, all that He is doing, and all that He will do. That's what worship is in its essence, is that we come and we recognize all that God has done, all that he is doing, and all that he will do. And we spent the last seven weeks in our series talking about the story, looking at what God did in history. And one of the things that we studied in the story was how Jesus came. And then the pinnacle of this story, the tree that stands between the two trees that we looked at last week was the tree of cross of Christ, where we recognize that Jesus died for our sins. And when he, when he came and when he, um, right before he was going to die, he met with his disciples in a room and he said, I want you to gather together. And when you gather together, I want you to come around this story because this story matters more than any other story. That this is my body, which I'm going to give to you. I'm going to die for you. And here's my blood that I, here, here's the cup of juice which represents my blood that I'm going to pour out on the cross for you. And when you gather together, I want you to remember, remember what I did for you. So we do that as a continuation of our worship. I mean, I, I want us by more than anything else to view this time of communion as just a continuation of what we just did in singing. Because it is worship as we gather those emblems together, as we sit we partake. And like we do every week, we're going to give you an opportunity to gather, to grab a piece of bread and a cup of juice, gather together with a group of people around you, and spend some more moments worshiping by talking to God and thanking him for all that he's done for you, all that he has done, all that he is doing, and all that he will do in your life. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your sacrifice for us. Thank you for the story that matters more than any other story because it changed the outcome of our lives. That when you came, you you died. And then you rose victoriously three days later, beating death so that we could experience life in you. We continue in our worship this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You take a few moments to... All right, a couple of announcements as we do that. Kids, you can be dismissed. Pathfinders uh, on this side, climbers on this side. A couple of announcements before we continue on in our service today. Um, We have the... uh, We have the block party carnival coming up in this summer, and we have need to get people signed up to help with that because it takes the whole church to put that on for our neighborhood. So if you can be there... um, for that day, uh, please sign up so we know who's available. It's on the connect table right out the back doors. As you leave the back doors, there's a table right there. That is the connect table. Eventually, when um, I get around to it, there will be a cool-looking sign hung up. They'll say connect. Um, So you'll know where the connect table is. I haven't gotten to that yet. Because we've been building sheds, and uh, yesterday was full of building sheds. Um, Thank you to the crew who is here who was able to work on that uh, all day yesterday. Um, We want you to be able to look at that. Uh, So there's little signs on the doors that say, you know, uh, don't go out there. That's mostly to keep the kids from running around there and hurting themselves. Uh, If you, especially for those of you who journeyed with us for a long time, you know how these sheds have been coming for a long time. And I know that some of you are very excited to see the progress of them. So after church, uh, go ahead and go take a look at them. Um, Scott's doing an amazing job heading up the team. Great crew of guys out yesterday. Lorna feeding us all. We're so thankful for that. So um, those are the two things I have. Sign up for the block party on the connect table right out the back of the doors after service. Um, and then go take a look at the, um, the sheds being built. They're not quite done yet. We still got a little more work to do on them. But uh, they're well on their way. Today I'm excited um, to uh, have Pete and Christy with us. Um, they were here a few weeks, uh, about a month ago, a month and a half ago, uh, but didn't speak. They are church planters that have moved to the area. So I'm going to invite them to come and share a little bit. Um, I'm gonna, they're going to share their story a little bit. And then Pete's going to share God's word for us. 
uh, this morning. So um, as they come, let me make sure to grab... All right, uh, Pete, Christy, now, can you guys, first of all, just help us out, um, because everybody's seen your last name in the bulletin, can you just help us out with pronunciation so we don't just keep murdering it every time? Yeah, Jakowski. No. no, that's no. the, that's the, <laughs> if you were in Poland, that's how you would say it. If you're in America, you'd say Zilkowski. 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 Okay, you guys all got that now, right? All right. Um, so... Would you share with us just briefly about um, where you've come from, like where, where you were at six months ago, mm -hmm. and, then, and then what's brought you to this area, and more specifically, East County? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. I first just want to say thank you so much for having us. We have loved like every opportunity to worship with you guys, to um, just have relationships and um, engage with you. It's been such a joy. And as we were singing that last song, How Great Thou Art, I just was overwhelmed with a sense of this family um, commending the works of God from one generation to the next in that um, saying how great is our God in and, out of in and out of season. And some of you that have been around longer, just how many years and seasons we've been saying how great is our God and what an impact that's having mm -hmm. even now um, on the generations that are growing up. So I just want to say well done and thank you so much for inviting us to be a part of this beautiful family. So we came, fr I agree, um, <laughs> we came from Wisconsin. Um, we spent uh, eight or nine, almost like 10 years total, uh, planting a church in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, and then from 2021 to um, about 2023, God had us on a sabbatical of sorts. So um, for a variety of different reasons, God made it clear that we needed to take a step out of vocational ministry and uh, enter into a time of rest and repentance and restoration. And during that season, uh, we got connected with Sean Tomei, uh, the executive director of Expand Northwest. And just as we continued in conversations with Sean, it was really clear to us that what God was doing in Portland, in the city, but also the what he was doing amongst the churches was the same kinds of things that he was doing in our hearts. Yeah, we just really, um, I think because God has brought us from our own, um, I guess, pits, um, we've been really um, compelled to step into margins and um, encourage people and hope that we've experienced in the redemption that he's um, done in our lives. And so being in spaces where there's felt um, visible need is just something that we sense Jesus' heart just aching um, and, po and pounding hard after, and we, um, yeah, just so want to be with him in that, and um, how the churches have been um, incredibly hospitable, and mm -hmm. just locking arms for the kingdom of God has been so beautiful to us. Mm -hmm. So you guys moved out about six months ago. Yep. Uh, December, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they have been um, in residency or in fellowship with um, the Bridge Church, which we helped plant about four years ago, um, and then um, our support has um, come, like there's, the bridge has now been, is fully like internally supported. And so our financial support has fallen off. And we have, um, as they have come to the bridge to do their residency and being planted from the bridge and mm -hmm. through Expand Northwest, uh, we're partnering in with that as well and helping plant um, the church here. Um, it's so new that we don't even have a name yet. Do we? <laughs> That's I mean, exactly yeah. right. <laughs> so um, we're, we're partnering in um, not only financially, but just we want to be involved with the church plant because as you guys have the journey with us for a while know we helped plant the bridge but it was it was on the in Wilsonville it was on the other side of uh, the world the world <laughs> for us East County folks right we don't <laughs> venture that direction very often um, so we had we didn't really get to be involved with kind of boots on the ground helping out in a lot of those ways you guys are looking at planting mm -hmm. in East County yep um, you want to share maybe your heart for East County as you've come from the outside from Milwaukee and just yeah. drove around our city and your hearts kind of fell in love with East County. Um, mm -hmm. How has God kind of called you to East County area and kind of more specifically what neighborhoods you're yeah. in that area? Yeah, for sure. You want to go? I'll go ahead. Well, I think one of the things that, like Christy was saying, that God has just always put on our hearts that, and even like we're, we'll talk about in a little bit here with um, Isaiah 61, that, that God's 
heart is just for those who are hurting and marginalized. And as we've gotten to know the city, it seems like some of the more prominent areas of expressed pain anyway are kind of in East County, which does not mean that there's no brokenness in other areas, but it expresses itself differently um, on the east side of Portland. And so that's really where we feel called to be. We feel called to be among a more um, ethnically and culturally diverse people group. We feel called to be around those who are um, disadvantaged and in, in overlooked in some, in some other ways. And so as we were just praying about well, where that might be, um, it seemed like God continued to uh, point us in this direction. And as we were just talking with people um, about what we feel like God has called us to do and the, and the, the kind of ministry he's called us to be engaged in, leader after leader, church after church was saying, oh yeah, this part of the city like matches what you guys are talking about. And um, if we could, some, some leaders were saying that if they could start over or if they could start a, a new um, uh, branch of their ministry, kind of the this, uh, Park Rose area is where they feel like they would want to go. And we're like, okay, that's the stuff that God's been putting on our hearts. And Christy in particular has been able to really be involved with some of those things with transitional youth and breaking cycles. Yeah, I, I think that we started out with just a lot of surrender. The sabbatical that we took the couple of years before we came here, um, God really just showed us how trustworthy he was with us opening our hands completely. And um, so as we like take these steps, you know, all the way from Wisconsin to here, um, just saying, okay, God, we, to the best of our ability, we're trusting you, um, lead us. Um, and he has, he's just clarified and honed in and um, I think pruned and, um, narrowed us in, in in that area, both by continuing to open doors relationally and in ministry and in home and all of that. So, um, yeah, he's just making it really clear that's where he wants us, and we're so grateful because we love it and um, can't wait to, to dig in deeper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You just bought a house here in East Side, right? Yep. Um, so that's exciting. Yeah. They've been renting out in Wilsonville and just bought um, a place out here. 168-ish? Right? One, 142 in Burnside. Okay. <laughs> I was waiting for it. I knew the, gro <laughs> I knew the groan was coming. I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> they really wanted to be part of it, so they, they bought there. Um, so uh, can you share just briefly um, your website, how we can yeah. partner along? And, and this will be kind of, it will just continue to unfold how we are going to be able to partner with them uh, as their plant continues to kind of gain steam, and um, mm -hmm. but if, if they want more information to get updates yep. about what what God's doing, um, where to go? Yeah, so we are really looking forward to being able to continue to grow in relationship with you all. We love what God is doing here. It's so encouraging to be with you all, and so um, within the next month or so, we will be physically in this area, and so we hope that we'll be able to physically see you more often. In the meantime, if you we uh, we did create a website for our church plant. The the URL is super creative. It's portlandchurchplant.com. So if you go there um, and just kind of cruise around on that website, you can see different ways that you can sign up for prayer updates, blog updates, uh, and so on and so forth. And then um, we'll be able to stay in touch and let you know what's going on and continue to grow in relationship. All right, before... Um Pete speaks. Let me just pray. Let's just all pray over um, Pete and Christy. God, we're so thankful for um, Pete and Christy and their call from you to come out to this area, to partner in ministry, um, to see uh, East County especially come to know you. Um, we're excited to um, see the gospel continuing to be proclaimed in um, some of the tougher part of our city and just uh, looking forward to how you're going to continue to move and work um, through Pete and Christy, um, through our partnership with them, and uh, just the story that you're writing um, is yet to be unfold, but we're looking forward to it. Um, God, we pray a blessing over them and their family as they, even the details of just moving over the next month uh, are hitting them hard. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Will you share? be reading from Isaiah 61 this morning, and then um, Pete is going to teach on it. Pray for him because he's not a multitasker. 
as it were. And so clicking and teaching at the same time is new for him. (laughs) Isaiah 61. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, to release from darkness the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Strangers will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and vineyards. And you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations and in their riches you will boast. Instead of shame, you will receive a double portion. And instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance. And so you will inherit a double portion in your land, and everlasting joy will be yours. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. In my faithfulness, I will reward my people and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are the people the Lord has blessed. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in robes of righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the soil makes a sprout come up and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. What a beautiful passage, isn't it? Man. Um, so does anyone know what this bush is, what this flower, this plant? Uh, nope. You're, uh, Beth, uh, roadie something? Yeah, rhododendron, is that how you say that? Okay, so this is a rhododendron bush, and it's huge. If you're from Wisconsin. This is a big rhododendron bush in Wisconsin. Now, do you know what happens when you plant the same seed in Oregon soil? It's like on steroids. It's wild to see how how nature functions out here. We have been so amazed by so much about Oregon. I mean, being from the Midwest, roads go straight. In Oregon, <laughs> they do not. <laughs> you don't even need cruise control here because you're never going to go the same speed for more than, you know, 400 meters or so. Um, but, like, there's been so much about Oregon that has just blown our minds and nature being one of them. It is shocking to see how much of an impact soil and climate have on the same seed. And now, if this is what happens... When plants are planted in a different place, just from Wisconsin to Oregon, can you imagine what these roadie bushes are going to look like in heaven? It's going to be incredible, isn't it? And as incredible as that will be, you will be even more so. Our passage this morning promises that our transformation into the, the strength and the beauty of God begins now. We can start to see glimpses of this, the, 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 the deposit of the future that God has promised. We can start to see in our lives here and now, in our cities here and now. It'll be completed later, but it's the beginning. It's a promise of the fruit that God will bring to bear, the redemption that God intends to bring into our lives and our cities and this world. So I'm going to take a minute, I'm going to pray again, and then we'll dive into this passage a little more. Father in heaven, thank you 
thank you that your spirit is with us. That the spirit of the sovereign Lord has eyes that are attentive to the broken, to the hurting, that there is no tear that we cry that you do not see and gather. Holy Spirit of God, I've just had a sense in this morning since we've been in this place that heaven is open. And so God, I pray, would you shower us with the mercy, the compassion, the healing, the hope that you want us to know. God, like seeds that are planted and tended to in a garden, would you tend to our souls now in this moment? We want to hear your voice. We want to experience your presence. So God, take your word and do what only you can do. Make it come alive in us so that we would bear fruit that would bring good news to our neighbors and the nations. Holy Spirit of God, make your goodness known in this place, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. From my vantage point, few passages in all of Scripture do a better job of comprehensively displaying God's heart than Isaiah 61. God had put this passage on my wife's heart when she was in college as kind of a, a life verse for her. And he has continued to point us back to this again and again and again. Everywhere we've gone, from small towns to big cities, from Wisconsin to Oregon, it seems like God just keeps on saying, this is what he's doing. And he's inviting us to partner into it. Some people say that God doesn't play favorites. And that's, I think, you know, in a sense that that's true. But I think that if you pay attention to the Bible you might be able to make the case that God, God does maybe favor one surprising group of people. It's the poor and the vulnerable, the hurting, the marginalized, those living on the outside of society's center. So take a look at verse 1. When the spirit of the sovereign Lord comes upon the prophet, where does he go? Who does he go to? He has to go to those who are broken down and broken hearted, doesn't he? He just, he just gets compelled to move into that area. He wants to bring good news of healing and mercy, compassion and redemption. He wants people who have been beaten down by injustice and suffering to know that there is a God who sees and who cares. It's like God can't help himself. He sees all of the junk you've ever gone through and it breaks his heart. His heart aches with what makes your heart break. He hears the cries of those who have been dealt an unfair, unjust hand in this life, and he is moved with compassion and mercy. But the compassion and mercy that our God moves with isn't um, docile, right? Like, he, he does, he weeps with those who weeps, he grieves with us, but he grieves with power, he grieves and moves with a compassion that can change things, that can bring justice, that can bring healing. He has the power and authority to heal our broken hearts with his love. Just check out all these insteads in verse 3. Beauty instead of ashes. Celebration instead of mourning. Praise instead of despair. Celebration. This is what happens when our hearts are planted in the soil of God's love. Verse 3 says that we become oaks of righteousness that display God's splendor. Isn't that a beautiful picture? I mean, if you could choose 
if Rody bushes could choose which soil they would be planted in, planted in, do you think they would take Wisconsin or Oregon? <laughs> do you think they'd be kind of like, eh, a little wimpy or like majestic, right? They're taking Oregon, so are we. Um, as much as we love Wisconsin. But when I see the, this picture described, beauty instead of ashes, joy instead of mourning, praise instead of despair, when I see this, and actually let me check to see if this next one had, no, okay, we'll go back. We'll, we'll get to that later. Um, when I see this description, it makes me ask a question because, I mean, I don't know how you all feel, but I don't feel like every moment of my day is like praise instead of despair, joy instead of mourning. You know what I mean? This doesn't always match my life. And so to what extent do you feel like this description matches yours? Are there areas in your life where you feel strong, where you feel beautiful, where you feel like you are displaying God's splendor? And are there areas of your life where you don't? What parts of your life can you see how the Holy Spirit of God has indeed touched the tender places in your soul and brought healing and redemption where you know you now display splendor where there used to be despair? How'd that happen? What did God do to intersect your life and leave you forever changed? In those places, did the joy fade or is it still vibrant? Why? Several years ago, the Holy Spirit stopped me in my tracks when I read a passage similar to this. It was in John 7. And I saw that Jesus promised that whoever comes to him will have streams of living water flowing from within them. And it's just, it just smacked me upside the head because I'm not that bright. And so God was just showing me that what was going on in my heart did not feel like streams of living water that were just like bubbling up uncontainably to refresh the people around me and bring life and vibrancy into my close relationships. That's not how things were. And I, when I reflected on the, the, the culture of the church that I was... Um, uh, one of the pastors of at the time, I looked at our church culture and I'm like, this does not look like living water. This looks like a bunch of very tired people <laughs> who are working really hard and are living with all of this pressure and anxiety. And I'm like, Lord, what is going on? Why am I not experiencing this living water? If I'm not experiencing this living water, then there must be at least some parts of my soul that I am not turning over to Jesus. There's something going on inside me that I'm keeping from him, whether intentionally or not, I don't know, but I just ask the Holy Spirit, search my heart and show me, and God is so faithful and kind and gentle. If you're willing to pray those prayers and vulnerability, he's not going to come in with the sledgehammer and, and just leave you decimated. He's going to speak in kindness and tenderness. And that's what he did for me. I promise that's what he'll do for you. And he just showed me that I was not abiding in God's love. There were areas of my heart that were not in that place. We all carry wounds and scars. We have fears. Even those who have lived a pretty charmed life, and praise God if that's you, if you don't have a, a story of tragedy in your life, praise God. Thank him for that. But even those of us who have basically lived good, like had, have had good and healthy lives, stuff has still come at you sideways, right? Things have still happened to you that God did not want to have happen, and now you have to figure out what to do with that. And often the pain that we carry in our hearts can be so tender that we don't want anyone to touch it. Not even God. Some of us are haunted by memories of being abused or abandoned. 
Some of us don't know if we can ever bring ourselves to trust another person because we have been betrayed. We've been vulnerable with people and it's been exploited and weaponized against us. Many have experienced excruciating pain that human beings were just not designed for. And some of us, some of us carry another kind of pain. We may have been beaten up a little bit, but some of us have to carry shame, feel like we have to carry shame from being the ones who have done the beating up, who have been the exploiters. And every day we're taunted and harassed by a shaming voice that won't let us forget the pain we've inflicted on others. When we're dealing with this, when our hearts feel like they can't open up to trust a person, when we feel like we have to just fight off this nagging voice in our heads that says we deserve terrible things to happen to us because we've done terrible things to others, when these are the thoughts that are in our heads, it makes it awfully difficult to plant your heart in God's love. Like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, we hide from God, we hide from others, we don't even want to have to think about our shame ever again. And for those who have had their hearts exploited, we fight to protect ourselves. We can be tempted to believe that no one else will protect us. Not even God, we think. And so we keep everyone and everything at a safe distance. And the problem with both of those approaches is that your heart, my heart, it needs to be planted in some kind of soil. We can't sustain ourselves. We need to be nourished and nurtured by something. And if we choose to plant our thoughts, our fears, our hope in soil of shame or bitterness or fear or self-preservation, jadedness, skepticism, if those are the thoughts that run through our head, if those are the places we protect ourselves and nourish our, our, our inner self with, our lives will produce the fruit according to it. And it won't be good. I mean, anybody feeling this? Does it feel good to live that way? It doesn't, does it? Man, if you can relate to any of this, please hear God's heart for you in this passage. Look at what Jesus promises He's saying there is something better for you. There's something better for me. There's something better for us. There's something better for us to experience together that will bring life and vibrancy into our communities. God is not, he, I'm not bringing this up because God wants to beat us down. He wants to lift us up. He wants us to be nourished and nurtured by his voice, not the one that wants to steal, kill, and destroy He's drawn to the broken down and the brokenhearted. He has healing for the victim and redemption for the victimizer. From both sides of the equation, the solution is the same. It's abiding in Jesus. It's being planted in the love of God. When Christy read this passage... You may have recognized this from something Jesus said. Did anybody kind of pick that up? Because Jesus uses this passage in, yeah, Luke 4, 18 and 19. He, he talks about part of the passage to announce his ministry, saying that this passage is about him and it's fulfilled in him. But if you're paying close attention, like if you have your Bibles, you can look at Isaiah 61 in your Bibles and look at the middle of verse 2. can't remember if I have this on here or not. Yeah. Okay, so look at where 
this one ends. So this is what Jesus quoted in Luke 4. It ends with saying that he's going to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, right? But if you look at verse 2, after the year of the Lord's favor, he talks about vengeance and judgment in Isaiah. So when Jesus quotes Isaiah, he stops short of talking about vengeance and judgment. Why? Because Jesus didn't come to bring judgment. He came to be judged. He came to be judged, not just generally, but very specifically for me, for you, for that shame we carry, he took on himself and he took it to the cross. The pain that's in our hearts, he bore in his being so that it could be crucified with Christ, buried in a grave and never see the light of day again. Now, if you know you've messed up, then you know how incredible this good news is. You don't have to carry your shame. You don't have to be the one who makes up for all the mess that you've made. Jesus will do it. He has done it. And we know that we can see how he did it. Because all of those insteads that we saw we get to enjoy, beauty instead of ashes, God pours that out on us because of, what was po- because of the wrath that was poured out on Jesus. Jesus was able to exchange the opposite of all of the goodness he deserves to receive all of the badness we deserve so that we could live in the joy that belongs to the Son of God being perfectly loved by the Father. That's what we're wrapped up in now. See, Jesus exchanged his crown of glory for our crown of thorns so that we could enjoy and display his beauty. He was held captive by our sin and nailed to our cross so that we could be released from every debt and set free to live with his record of righteousness. Jesus was clothed with our despair, being deserted even by God so that we could be given the splendid clothes of his righteousness and adopted into the family of God. We will never be forsaken. We will never be abandoned. And we know that Jesus has the full authority and the power to bring all of this to bear in our very personal lives because he was crucified, but he didn't stay dead, did he? Three days later, he was raised from the grave in a glorified body. He ascended into heaven, poured out his Holy Spirit on the church, and has promised one day to come back and collect his bride. Amen? Amen. That's our hope. That's the love that our hearts get to abide in. This is the soil that God wants you to take your pain to. This is the soil that God wants you to take your shame to. And we put it in that soil of God's love and our pain will be healed. Our shame will be taken care of. It is redemptive and resurrecting. We become new people. Not just better versions of who we used to be, but completely new people. Man, and when that happens, communities are transformed. That's what verse 4 gets into. Because this talks about like great things going on, but in the context of Isaiah 61, who's doing this beautiful redemptive rest, restoration kind of work? Isn't it the people who were formerly devastated? Right? So the people who are formerly devastated, who God is doing a new redemptive work in, can't help themselves but now bring beauty and redemption everywhere around them. That's how the places that were formerly devastated become beautified. It's by the people who were formerly devastated becoming enraptured in the love of God. I don't remember where I was. I need a second. (laughs) This pat doesn't this passage seem like it was just like written for Portland? At least for this time, 
right? This is hope. This is the hope of God's word. It's not just like, a, hey, we're going to see great things happen. Now, God's promised this, church. <laughs> this is God's word. It doesn't return void. He isn't fickle. He doesn't play games with us. Since we've moved here, now, we don't know what Portland used to be like, but since we've moved here, people have told us, uh, they've almost been like apologetic for the state of the city. Like, yeah, things used to be great, but now, sorry, moving to 142 in Burnside. <laughs> Man, I don't know. We think it's beautiful. I understand. I don't want to minimize it, uh, the pain that anyone's experienced because like the, 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 the stats... The stats are tough, man. Since 2020, Portland has the sixth largest population decline of all the major cities in the nation. Portland has the fifth highest houseless population. And this last one's rough, isn't it? Overdose deaths have increased by 533%. Man, this breaks God's heart. Now, I don't want to minimize this or dismiss the pain of this in any way, especially if you are one of the people who's been impacted by these stats. But when we look at Isaiah 61, we look at verse 4, we see that the people who are in pain are the people that God's eyes are attentive to, and he will do a restorative work in them, and then he will bring restoration through them. This is what happens when we place our hearts in the revitalizing love of God. This is the only place that our hearts can be healed, and it truly is the only place that our hearts can be safe. Who else is going to care for you like this? Who else can love you enough to die for you and is strong enough to protect you too? as God increasingly heals and restores the core of our being, we won't be able to help ourselves from overflowing with this redemptive goodness. And it's because of the love that we're planted in. It's, it's where our, the soil that our hearts are in. We will be compelled. If our hearts are planted in God's love, we're going to be compelled to love the people that God loves. <laughs> we're going to want to be where Jesus is. We're going to want to do what Jesus does. So we're going to go to the, to the places and be with the people that he cares about. And the Bible is pretty clear that he cares about the brokenhearted, the devastated. The place is long devastated. There's nothing sweeter than experiencing the presence of God. Nothing. And if you want to experience the presence of God, then you need to go where God has said his presence is. And it's often not in the places that are pretty. Although God's beauty can be there too. Like, go ahead, hike in the gorge, go to the coast. I plan to too. But God is with the brokenhearted. He's in the places long devastated. It's where he said the Spirit sends us. This is the love. This is the vision. This passage is what has compelled us to move our little family from Wisconsin to 142nd and Burnside. <laughs> because we believe that God's there that he's doing something, and we just want to be a part of it. We believe that God is planting a new church in that context so that he can plant more people in his love, so that more beauty and redemption can spring up all around. Man, we are so thankful for being with you on this journey. You all have been engaged in East County? Is this still East County? Yeah? You've all been engaged in East County far longer than we have, and you have been a faithful presence in this neighborhood. You have opened up your church and your hearts to people in a community that aren't sure yet that God is quite as good as he claims to be. But on July 13th, you're going to have a block party so that the neighborhood can see that there's a God who's here <laughs> and he loves them, and he's inviting them in, and he's not going anywhere. On June 9th, you're going to have a potluck. Like You're going to get together and share a meal. That's good stuff. You've demonstrated that God is good. You keep showing that he cares. You do this with the neighbors. You've done this with us. 
You have no, no obligation to us. You don't know us. I hope that that turns out okay for you. <laughs> You've been remarkably generous, and we're so honored to be able to partner with you all. But as excited as we are to get to work with you, to watch God bring beauty from ashes, we're even more excited to just be saturated in God's presence with you. Because verse 11 shows where redemption happens. In the same way that the earth produces crops and gardens cultivate seeds, so having our hearts planted in God's love is what causes righteousness and praise to adorn the nations. Does this just blow your mind? It's just this so remarkable. How does God heal and redeem hearts? How are cities transformed? I mean, we could talk about a lot of things, economic structures, justice systems, and so forth, and, and, and we should. But it turns out that seeing transformation of individuals and cities is as elementary as loving God with everything you have <laughs> and loving your neighbor as yourself. The Holy Spirit invites us to partner with him in the work that he's already doing in this world. Not because we deserve to, and certainly not because he needs us, but all because he loves us like crazy. He's crazy about you, and he wants to show you what he's doing, and he wants you to enjoy that too. He wants us to be a part of seeing his kingdom come and his will be done in Portland as it is in heaven. Now, I understand that entrusting the tender places of your heart to anyone, including God, can be a very scary thing. But it is the only place that we're safe. Verse 11 basically is describing God like a master gardener, as far as I can tell. And I say as far as I can tell because I don't know anything about gardening, do you? <laughs> I am not a arborist. I am not a planter of seeds or anything like that. Um, but I know people who are. We had neighbors, Paul and Eileen, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and we lived in a, uh, a very densely populated area. Like, our houses were so on top of each other that if you leaned out the window, you could touch the house next door. And there was an alley that ran uh, behind our house, and, um, but Paul and Eileen, they had an orchard in their yard, and they loved it. They thought about it all the time. They started their seeds in the winter inside and they like purposely organized everything outside so that they were like the right things were planted in the right places next to the other right things so that cross-pollination could happen. And it was like this beautiful orchard springing up in their yard. And one of the things that made it so incredible was the contrast because in the middle of this concrete jungle, their yard was an urban sanctuary. It was so beautiful. And they, not, only did they, not only was it beautiful, but they loved, to sh they loved doing it, but they loved to share it with others. They loved to invite people into their backyard and hang out or into their front yard and just be a part of enjoying what God has done. And I'm telling you, this is how God wants to treat us that he knows just what you need. He plants seeds in your heart and he has you positioned exactly where he wants you to be so that he can tend to you. He wants to nourish you and nurture you, protect you and provide for you. And he wants to have you be cross-pollinated in just the right way so he brings you into a church family so that you have the people around you that you need to grow up in all the ways that God wants you to. And as God creates this beautiful orchard out of your church, he will invite other people into it because he wants others to enjoy the good work that he is doing in you and through you. And as that pours out of you, man, we will see redemption come into this place. Amen? All right, well, let me pray. And then I think, uh, I think we worship next. Is that right? Well, hopefully we've been worshiping all the way through. But uh, we'll sing, I think. So, Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for River Hills. Thank you for these people who are precious in your sight. 
God, stir up our affections so that no lesser loves could possibly threaten the love that you want to share with us. Let your still small voice be louder than the shame we might hear. Let your calming presence drown out the pain. God, show us your goodness that we could place our vulnerabilities in your hands so that you can do what you want in us and through us and be as good to us as you want to be. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? We're going to sing. Um, what an opportunity. Thank you, Pete, for coming and sharing. Uh, um, and we're going to worship just and sing exactly what he talked about, these great things that we've seen God uh, do and, and believe to, to do and sing some of this in faith, believing that God still has great things to do because, not because we're great, but because he's great, because he's the hero of heaven who's conquered the grave. And so because of that, we have, we have hope and life in him. worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things.
between us I'll hide the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night And through the darkness Your loving kindness Saw through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, that has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. That has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Church, why don't we worship together here in this place? Not the third. 